In 1939, a fragile world which had just begun to climb out of the depths of global economic depression and ended the first truly global war in recorded history only 25 years earlier, peered downward into an abyss blacker than any it had ever glimpsed before. A doomed peace that began in Versailles eventually exposed its frayed edges in the 1930s. Germany, Italy, and Japan would soon plunge the world into a new conflict that would dwarf the so-called Great War of 1914. Italy invaded Ethiopia in 1935. Germany and Italy formed the Rome-Berlin Axis the next year. The Spanish Civil War then erupted, with Hitler and Mussolini providing support to the Spanish fascists led by Francisco Franco. Japan invaded China the year after that, in 1937. And all the while, Germany was concocting the most virulent strain of militaristic racial supremacy ever inflicted on society, in a bid to exact its grand revenge against Europe and the entire world. As German forces massed on the Polish border, the last decrepit shreds of peace fell into the swirling darkness that churned beneath. It was impossible to know the magnitude of the chaos that would ensue in the coming six years, but in time, the whole world would come to know that history would be divided into before this war and after. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland, signaling the outbreak of war in Europe. By September 3rd, France, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand had declared war on Germany. The alliance was joined later that week by South Africa and Canada. But by October 6th, Poland was German territory. After Poland, Germany targeted Denmark and Norway, which both fell within two months. Germany then immediately set its sights on France, which it flanked by first sweeping through Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. On the 10th of June, Italy invaded France, and Germany marched into Paris four days later. The Allied forces retreated from the continent at Dunkirk, and Britain was next in Germany's crosshairs. The Battle of Britain ensued in July 1940, when the United Kingdom, led by newly appointed Prime Minister Winston Churchill, was attacked by German air forces. The German Luftwaffe was first ordered to target shipping convoys and coastal ports in order to disrupt the British economy and military armament. On August 1st, the Luftwaffe was tasked with defeating the British Royal Air Force in order to achieve aerial supremacy over the island and prepare a ground invasion. RAF airfields and infrastructure were attacked to slow the production of British fighter planes. The RAF retaliated in late August, striking residential areas of Berlin. Following the RAF attack, Hitler ordered the Luftwaffe to target British cities in reprisal. On September 7th, a massive German attack involving nearly 400 bombers and more than 600 fighters targeted British towns, cities, and industrial centers. London was bombed for 56 days and nights straight. The Blitz, as it became known, was a period of ceaseless nighttime bombing raids, which lasted until May 1941. Germany eventually failed to achieve aerial supremacy over Britain in one of their first major defeats of World War II, but still killed over 40,000 British civilians. It was in these conditions that the London School of Economics, where Hayek had resided since 1931, evacuated London. For the academic year of 1939 to 1940, the LSE moved to Peterhouse College in Cambridge and then remained there throughout the war. Hayek's family initially moved in with the family of Lionel Robbins, while Keynes himself secured a room for Hayek at King's College. Robbins and many other LSE faculty members went into government service during the war. Hayek also attempted to serve in the government, but was denied. Later, Hayek moved his family to Cambridge, where they lived in a semi-converted barn for the rest of the war. But despite the somewhat uncomfortable conditions for Hayek and his family, the dormancy of the fledgling neoliberal movement born at the Kolok Walter Lippmann, and the horrific scale of conflict across the world, these war years would prove to be mostly kind to Hayek. In contrast with a world that seemed bent on destruction, Cambridge was a place that actually thrived during the war years, and the same is true of Hayek's intellectual and professional development. As a consequence of his colleagues leaving for government service, Hayek became the acting editor of the LSE journal Economica, the same journal in which he did battle with Keynes. Hayek continued giving lectures in advanced economic theory at Cambridge as he would have in London, even though the intellectual climate there, where Marx was required reading, frustrated him. Most importantly, he took on several ambitious projects rooted in political philosophy during these years that would greatly increase his global stature by 1945. And it was also during these years that Hayek and Keynes actually became closer in person, despite remaining ideological rivals. Hayek, an Austrian who had been naturalized as a British subject in 1938, found himself thoroughly at home in Cambridge, 
and placed all his sympathies with the English as he worked to the distant sound of falling bombs. But though Hayek might have found physical safety at Cambridge, intellectually, he was isolated. With all of his LSE colleagues gone into government service, he was left alone to find another way to protect liberal capitalism from spreading collectivism, which he feared was beginning to dominate the intellectual climate of British politics and academia. Acceptance of government intervention in the economy was on the rise. The misery of the Great Depression had birthed powerful new arguments against unmonitored capitalism and in favor of economic planning. The British Labour Party had officially endorsed socialism in its platform earlier in the 1930s. Keynes's general theory had just begun to tear through the mainstream of political and economic thought. William Beveridge's famous report, Social Insurance and Allied Services, would ignite the public support for a welfare state in the next three years. A large number of famous natural scientists in Britain, such as J.D. Bernal, J.B.S. Haldane, and Lancelot Hogben, outwardly supported communism. The founders of the Fabian Society, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, along with many other prominent leftist academics, such as William Beveridge, Harold Lasky, and Karl Mannheim, were now making a host of radical new claims that put liberal capitalism under scrutiny, such as that fascism was a natural outgrowth of a capitalist society in decay, that scientific progress would be stifled as long as capitalism persisted, and that planning was necessary to avoid totalitarianism of the left and right. Hayek's response to these conditions was to continue the departure from technical economic theory that he had started with Economics and Knowledge in 1936. In 1939, Hayek published an important pamphlet entitled Freedom and the Economic System, which primarily responded to the argument that fascism was an outgrowth of capitalism. According to Hayek, this pamphlet was originally born from a memorandum Hayek addressed directly to Beveridge and planted the early seeds of Hayek's most famous book in his entire career, The Road to Serfdom. Hayek explained, A very special situation arose in England, that people were seriously believing that National Socialism was a capitalist reaction against socialism. The main exponent whom I came across was Lord Beveridge, so I wrote a memorandum for Beveridge on this subject, then turned it into a journal article, and then used my time during the war to write out what was really a sort of advanced popular version of what I had imagined would be the great book on the abuse and decline of reason. It was adjusted to the moment, and wholly aimed at the British socialist intelligentsia, who all seemed to have this idea that national socialism was not just socialism, just something contemptible. In the midst of fascist oppression sweeping over the world, Leftist commentators such as Beveridge began questioning if fascism was permitted to spread by capitalist parties in order to shut out the influence of socialism and Marxism, which threatened much of the capitalist system, if not the whole thing. The argument followed that because private ownership of the means of production was still preserved under fascist regimes, entrenched wealthy interests still viewed fascism as preferable to socialism, making them complicit in the violence of fascist regimes in defense of capitalism. The iniquity permitted by capitalist societies also caused the masses to become susceptible to reactionary ideologies, further igniting the spread of fascism. Hayek considered this argument to be one of the most dangerous lines of reasoning against capitalism, and so he argued in Freedom and the Economic System that both socialism and fascism have common roots in economic planning, and in elevating the power of the state over that of the individual. Hayek wrote, The main point is very simple. It is that comprehensive economic planning, which is regarded as necessary to organize economic activity on more rational and efficient lines, presupposes a much more complete agreement on the relative importance of different social ends than actually exists, and that in consequence, in order to plan, the planning authority must impose upon the people the detailed code of values that is lacking. Put in another way, Hayek's point was that any attempts to plan the economy in service to goals such as greater efficiency or social justice might lead to the opposite of those intended consequences, because the planner would naturally have to decide which goods and services to create, and therefore which desires to satisfy, implicitly making a claim about which desires ought to be valued higher. And in order for the planner to avoid elevating one group's values at the expense of another's, they would naturally require more and more power to dictate economic outcomes, leading to total control over the political process itself. In Hayek's view, only a competitive market system could permit the entire diversity of values to find expression while preserving freedom. The pamphlet also confronted the idea that scientific progress was being constrained by capitalism, and in doing so, Hayek hinted at what would become his next major endeavor in political philosophy. Hayek wrote, It would be interesting, but it is not possible within the space available, to show how this belief is largely due to the intrusion into the discussion of social problems, the preconceptions of the pure scientist and the engineer, which have dominated the outlook of the educated man during the past hundred years. This argument, 
that the social sciences had been infected by an erroneous conception of reason that overestimated what reason can actually accomplish became the focus of a bold new treatise Hayek began at Cambridge, which he called the Abuse and Decline of Reason Project. The project was an enormous undertaking that Hayek worked on for almost the entire duration of World War II. Hayek initially intended to divide this work into two parts, which he called Hubris of Reason and The Nemesis of the Planned Society, and the completed work was meant to demonstrate how false conceptions of individual rationality, originating in France and Germany in the 18th century, had led to modern socialism's view of individual reason as powerful enough to plan and engineer all of society. This, Hayek argued, was inferior to true rationalism, originating in England and Scotland, which emphasized the relative insignificance of individual reason and the absence of deliberate intention behind complex phenomena. Whereas socialists believed enlightened individuals could deliberately plan a just and equitable society, Hayek believed that the spontaneous collaboration of free men would create a society greater than their individual minds could ever comprehend. Ultimately, however, the abuse and decline of reason would never be published in its originally intended structure. Instead, excerpts were published separately in a variety of different forms, including six articles published in Economica between 1941 and 1944, which were later collected and published as The Counter-Revolution of Science, Studies on the Abuse of Reason, in 1952. It was in these writings that Hayek coined the term scientism, or the mimicry and fetishization of science without respect for real scientific procedure. The final section of Hayek's grand work, originally titled The Nemesis of the Planned Society, is what eventually became The Road to Serfdom. The Road to Serfdom, first published in Britain in March 1944 by Routledge Press, is quite possibly the most important document there is for understanding the origins of modern neoliberal capitalism. It greatly extended all of the arguments Hayek first made in Freedom in the Economic System, and with even more force. It continued to counter the claim made by the leading leftist intellectuals in Britain that fascism was the product of discordant capitalism. It also aimed to demonstrate that just as socialism could never match the spontaneous order of a competitive market system, it also could never protect liberty as well as a competitive liberal society paired with a strong state that valued the rule of law. But most importantly, the road to serfdom was imbued with the urgency of a warning, that if any degree of socialism, which Hayek considered synonymous with complete economic planning, was permitted, all the greatest hallmarks of Western civilization would disappear, and even historically free countries like the United States and the United Kingdom would begin to resemble Nazi Germany. Hayek wrote in The Road to Serfdom, We have progressively abandoned that freedom in economic affairs without which personal and political freedom has never existed in the past, although we had been warned by some of the greatest political thinkers of the 19th century, by Tocqueville and Lord Acton, that socialism means slavery, we have steadily moved in the direction of socialism. We are rapidly abandoning not merely the views of Cobden and Bright, of Adam Smith and Hume, or even of Locke and Milton, but one of the salient characteristics of Western civilization as it has grown from the foundations laid by Christianity and the Greeks and Romans. Not merely 19th and 18th century liberalism, but the basic individualism inherited by us from Erasmus and Montaigne, from Cicero and Tacitus, Pericles and Thucydides, is progressively relinquished. On the topics of competition and planning, Hayek wrote, Economic liberalism is opposed to competitions being supplanted by inferior methods of coordinating individual efforts. Competition is superior not only because it is in most circumstances the most efficient method known, but even more because it is the only method by which our activities can be adjusted to each other without coercive or arbitrary intervention of authority. The increasing veneration for the state, the admiration of power, and of bigness for bigness's sake, the enthusiasm for organization of everything, we now call it planning, and that inability to leave anything to the simple power of organic growth are all scarcely less marked in England now than they were in Germany. On the topics of capitalism and democracy, Hayek wrote, It is now often said that democracy will not tolerate capitalism. If capitalism means here a competitive system based on free disposal over private property, it is far more important to realize that only within this system is democracy possible. When it becomes dominated by a collectivist creed, democracy will inevitably destroy itself. We have no intention, however, of making a fetish of democracy. It may well be true that our generation talks and thinks too much of democracy and too little of the values which it serves. Democracy is essentially a means, a utilitarian device for safeguarding internal peace and individual freedom. As such, it is by no means infallible or certain. It is largely responsible for the misleading and unfounded belief that, so long as the ultimate source of power is the will of the majority, the power cannot be arbitrary. 
Hayek was a believer in negative liberty, that the role of the state should be minimized and curtailed to the point of merely protecting its citizens and providing them access to markets, and as such, he accepted the existence of inequality as a necessary feature of society. Hayek wrote, A necessary, and only apparently paradoxical, result of this is that formal equality before the law is in conflict, and in fact incompatible, with any activity of the government deliberately aiming at material or substantive equality of different people, and that any policy aiming at a substantive ideal of distributive justice must lead to the destruction of the rule of law. To produce the same result for different people, it is necessary to treat them differently. To give different people the same objective opportunities is not to give them the same subjective chance. It cannot be denied that the rule of law produces economic inequality. All that can be claimed for it is that this inequality is not designed to affect particular people in a particular way. In one of the Road to Serfdom's final chapters, The Socialist Roots of Nazism, Hayek explicitly linked the National Socialism of Nazi Germany with the intellectual history of economic planning, turning the tables on socialists who were connecting the dots between capitalism and fascism. Hayek wrote, It is a common mistake to regard National Socialism as a mere revolt against reason, an irrational movement without intellectual background. If that were so, the movement would be much less dangerous than it is, but nothing could be further from the truth or more misleading. The doctrines of National Socialism are the culmination of a long evolution of thought, a process in which thinkers who have had great influence far beyond the confines of Germany have taken part. What, then, caused these views held by a reactionary minority finally to gain the support of the great majority of Germans and practically the whole of her youth? It was not merely the defeat, the suffering, and the wave of nationalism which led to their success. Still less was the cause, as so many people wish to believe, a capitalist reaction against the advance of socialism. On the contrary, the support which brought these ideas to power came precisely from the socialist camp. It was certainly not through the bourgeoisie, but rather through the absence of a strong bourgeoisie, that they were helped to power. Lastly, in the road to serfdom, Hayek laid the foundation for one of the core tenets of modern neoliberalism, that political freedom without economic liberty is impossible. Economic policies could not be merely contained within the economic sphere, and the choice to plan the economy or not would in fact have consequences for the whole of society. Given the stakes, the only option was to maximize economic liberty. Hayek wrote, The authority directing all economic activity would not merely control the part of our lives which is concerned with inferior things. It would control the allocation of the limited means for all of our ends. And whoever controls all economic activity controls the means for all our ends, and must therefore decide which are to be satisfied and which are not. This really is the crux of the matter. Economic control is not merely control of a sector of human life which can be separated from the rest. It is the control of the means for all our ends. Surprisingly, the road to serfdom never explicitly refutes the economics of Keynes, Beveridge, Marx, or the USSR specifically even though the ideas contained within would later be wielded against all of these camps. The reasons for this are numerous. Though Hayek had intended to confront the ideas of Marx in The Abuse and Decline of Reason, this ended up being a section that he never managed to complete. And though Hayek considered the Soviet Union to be a grave threat to liberty following World War II, at the time of his writing, the Red Army was fighting against the Nazis, making them an unsuitable target. As for Hayek's omission of Keynes, the reason for this may lie in Hayek and Keynes's relationship during the war years. As we know, it was Keynes who accommodated Hayek at Cambridge when London was being incessantly bombed. The time that Hayek spent at Cambridge provided him and Keynes the opportunity to reach mutual respect, and even friendship. Keynes would return to Cambridge from his government service in London on the weekends, or he and Hayek would take shifts together watching for fires from the roof of King's College at night. In 1940, Hayek actually praised the pamphlet Keynes had written, entitled How to Pay for the War in which Keynes included a suggestion by Hayek for a capital tax following the war. Hayek even ceased work on one of his own technical economic projects, the pure theory of capital, in part because the second half would have criticized Keynes, at a time when Keynes was working to get Britain through the war without increasing inflation. In a moment of practical politics, Hayek was on Keynes's side. Hayek explained, An attack on Keynes, during the war years, would have been against what I believed was right. I was grateful for his existence. Also surprisingly, but perhaps not, Keynes lauded the road to serfdom, despite the fact that he and Hayek were for the most part still intellectual rivals. Keynes wrote, My dear Hayek, in my opinion it is a grand book. Morally and philosophically I find myself in agreement with virtually the whole of it, and not only in agreement with it, but in deeply moved agreement. 
See, Keynes didn't believe in complete economic planning either. Keynes responded to socialists and communists with the argument that an international world currency, the Bancor, and an international clearing union could protect global Keynesian capitalism from depressions, providing a world of peace and trade for all. In fact, this is exactly what he argued for at the Bretton Woods Conference between world powers following World War II. Keynes didn't get what he wanted, mostly because the American delegate Henry Dexter White was able to secure more favorable conditions for the U.S. instead. But he still viewed demand management capitalism as the best way to secure a good life for most people. He wasn't in favor of a socialist or communist solution that abolished private ownership of the means of production or permitted the government to completely plan the economy. However, Keynes's praise did come with some caveats. I come to what is really my only serious criticism of the book. You admit here and there that it is a question of knowing where to draw the line. You agree that the line has to be drawn somewhere, and the logical extreme is not possible, but you give us no guidance whatever as to where to draw it. It is true that you and I would probably draw it in different places. I should guess that according to my ideas you greatly underestimate the practicability of the middle course. But as soon as you admit that the extreme is not possible, and that a line has to be drawn, you are, on your own argument, done for, since you are trying to persuade us that so soon as one moves an inch in the planned direction, you are necessarily launched on the slippery path which will lead you in due course over the precipice. I should say that what we want is not no planning, or even less planning, indeed I should say we almost certainly want more. But the planning should take place in a community in which as many people as possible, both leaders and followers, wholly share your own moral position. Moderate planning will be safe enough if those carrying it out are rightly oriented in their own minds and hearts to the moral issue. Keynes insisted that moderate economic planning could work if people understood the moral necessity of some economic planning and the moral hazards of complete planning or no planning. Hayek, on the other hand, simply didn't believe government or individuals were capable of finding a nuanced middle ground on planning without sliding down the path to complete totalitarianism. So, despite the fact that Keynes and Hayek were both capitalists who were not in favor of complete planning, Hayek perceived this latent threat of government domination in the ideas of all government interventionists, whether they were Keynesian or Marxist. Where Keynes saw a promising recovering society, Hayek and his followers saw resurgent totalitarianism, which had only just been defeated. While Keynes might have praised Hayek's political message, he reiterated to Hayek that the demand management policies currently working in the U.S. and Britain should be preserved and expanded. He didn't view Hayek's economic ideas as necessary or even having much of a chance of catching on. What we need, therefore, is not a change in our economic programs, which would only lead in practice to disillusion with the results of your philosophy, but perhaps even the contrary, namely an enlargement of them. Your greatest danger ahead is the probable practical failure of the application of your philosophy in the United States. Keynes was right about his first point. Keynesianism was working, and it did create enormous growth in employment in the United States after the government had committed to war spending. He was also correct that going back to a deregulated economy would likely increase the probability of instability or totalitarianism, exactly what Hayek was claiming to prevent. But on his second point, Keynes was very, very wrong. The road to serfdom sold out, making a powerful impact on the thinking of many British and American economists, politicians, businessmen, and thought leaders for decades. The book literally went out of print due to intense paper rationing during the war years, leading to Hayek's nickname, That Unobtainable Book. The book's American debut in September 1944 through University of Chicago Press was even more explosive than the British release. Public exposure to the book was increased yet again when Reader's Digest included a condensed version of the book for millions of American subscribers in 1945. The book has even received treatment as a comic and a graphic novel, and its popularity has not waned even to the present day. Hayek went on a promotional book tour in the U.S. after publication, where he was greeted like a celebrity. He made important connections in America during this time that would bear fruit later. The road to serfdom made Hayek into a global figure, and symbolized for those around the world still allied to liberal capitalism a brave dissent against a monolithic academic consensus on the necessity of economic planning and a rallying cry for all opponents of collectivism to join forces. Following Hayek's American book tour in the summer of 1945, Hayek published a more obscure but no less significant work than The Road to Serfdom. It was the follow-up to his groundbreaking work in Economics and Knowledge of 1936, which was entitled The Use of Knowledge in Society. Though it was more appreciated by academics than the general public when compared to The Road to Serfdom, it was arguably just as critical for his two-pronged critique of socialism. If the road to serfdom was meant to demonstrate socialism's incompatibility with liberty, 
the use of knowledge in society was meant to further cement its inferior economic efficiency. To reiterate, in Economics and Knowledge, Hayek made the argument that the knowledge required to organize an economy was dispersed, fragmented, and located in the minds of many individuals, and that no governmental authority could ever command this entire body of knowledge from a central point, which was the entire approach of socialist planning. The use of knowledge in society carried this point even further, by specifically identifying the price system as the mechanism that a competitive market society uses to spread accurate information. Similar to Adam Smith's conception of the invisible hand, the fluctuations of prices in a competitive liberal order were the transmissions that allowed individual participants in the market to understand what resources and ideas had value in the world without requiring the totality of information. And it was these hyper-efficient and automatic price signals that were conspicuously absent from any central planning approach that attempted to solve the entire calculation problem through a never-ending process of trial and error resource allocation. Hayek wrote, We must look at the price system as a mechanism for communicating information if we want to understand its real function. The most significant fact about this system is the economy of knowledge with which it operates, or how little the individual participants need to know in order to be able to take the right action. Only the most essential information is passed on, and passed on only to those concerned. It is more than a metaphor to describe the price system as a kind of machinery for registering change, or a system of telecommunications, which enables individual producers to watch merely the movement of a few pointers, as an engineer might watch the hands of a few dials, in order to adjust their activities to changes of which they may never know more than is reflected in the price movement. If we can agree that the economic problem of society is mainly one of rapid adaptation to changes in the particular circumstances of time and place, it would seem to follow that the ultimate decisions must be left to the people who are familiar with these circumstances, who know directly of the relevant changes and of the resources immediately available to meet them. We cannot expect that this problem will be solved by first communicating all this knowledge to a central board which, after integrating all knowledge, issues its orders. We must solve it by some form of decentralization. It's easy to see how Hayek's worldview on economics, politics, and philosophy took on a powerful and elegant form during the Second World War. Hayek's philosophical approach to economics was from the fundamental position that man's reasoning capabilities were limited. The impulse to plan and coordinate the economy, in service to greater justice, was lofty but hubristic, because this impulse flew in the face of the reality that institutions like the economy were spontaneous orders, that no single mind could comprehend. Attempts to control and command these spontaneous orders would not just lead to inferior economic performance, but the disappearance of political freedom altogether. The only economic and political configuration capable of preserving liberty and democracy was a competitive liberal order protected by a strong state that would allow the market to carry out its primary function without interruption, to provide the widest possible latitude to every individual participant in the market without the intervention of authority. What's peculiar about Hayek's perspective is that it actually transcended the field of economics. It was a political vision for how society, information, and indeed the entire world ought to be structured and it does a great deal for us in explaining the deeply held beliefs at the heart of neoliberal thought. Hayek considered the market as an unconscious and yet omnipotent arbiter of value that would maximize freedom and liberty by simply being accessible to all citizens, who could express their economic freedom through consumption, and their political freedom by whose ideas they financially supported. To Hayek, the only real political dangers were totalitarianism, collectivism, planning, and socialism, and the market was the only institution that could protect against them. Humanistic ideals such as democracy and social justice were at best already provided by the free market and therefore required no articulation, or, at worst, were much less necessary for the operation of a free society than economic liberalism. Hayek's logic was, if democracy and social justice had any value, then the omnipotence of price signals in a competitive market would indicate it. In truth, Hayek wasn't just providing a new economic policy like Keynes. He was creating a new epistemology that proclaimed markets were a way of knowing an observable force like gravity, a natural process like an ecosystem that converted subjective values, opinions, and realities into objective facts, through prices. Following the road to serfdom, the use of knowledge in society, and the close of World War II, the early neoliberal movement finally emerged from hibernation. There were about five or six disparate groups of economists, historians, philosophers, and entrepreneurs, who now began to coalesce around the goals of defending individualism and economic liberalism from all variations of collectivism or government interventionism, whether they were capitalist or socialist. There were the British economists at the London School of Economics in Manchester, including Lionel Robbins, Arnold Plant, Karl Popper, 
Ronald Coast, John Jukes, Stanley Dennison, and Michael Polanyi, the brother of Karl Polanyi. There were the Austrian economists who had been exiled to the U.S. by the Nazis, including Ludwig von Mises, Gottfried Haberler, and Fritz Matchlub. There were the French philosophers who sprouted out of the clock Walter Lippmann, including Louis Rougier, Raymond Daron, and Jacques Ruff. Back in Germany, there was a holdout of liberal academics whose association with the journal Ordo led to their nickname the Ordo Liberals. These Ordo Liberals included Walter Eucken, Franz Boom, Alexander Rousteau, and Wilhelm Rock. Then there was the University of Chicago Economics Department, which incubated multiple generations of neoliberal economists. The foundation of the Chicago School, as it was called, was laid by Frank Knight, Henry Simons, Jacob Viner, Aaron Director, Theodore Schultz, and Lloyd Mintz. These elder academics brought up a second generation of the Chicago School, which included Milton Friedman, George Stickler, James Buchanan, Arnold Harberger, Gary Becker, Gordon Tullock, and Edward Levi. Buchanan and Tullock, along with William Riker, would go on to contribute significantly to the development of public choice theory, an important offshoot of neoliberal thinking which was based primarily in Virginia and Rochester. Outside of academia, a powerful group of American and British businessmen, entrepreneurs, and journalists who were deeply moved by the road to serfdom and vitriolically opposed to the New Deal and British welfare provided invaluable financial and ideological support to these neoliberal academics. Figures such as Albert Hunold, Leonard Reed, Floyd A. Harper, Harold Leno, Henry Hazlitt, Lawrence Fertig, Lauren B. Miller, Jasper Crane, Edwin Fulner, Anthony Fisher, Ralph Harris, Arthur Selden, and Manuel Ayao each played important roles in increasing the power and prestige of neoliberal policy. They financially supported neoliberal research and conferences, erected a vast empire of free market think tanks that prolifically published neoliberal policy solutions, conducted aggressive outreach campaigns to influence the opinions of academics, politicians, and journalists, and poured accolades onto their own neoliberal allies through the establishment of their own insular network of research organizations and private universities. Hayek's writings placed him at the nexus of this new international movement, and he quickly set out to work organizing it. In 1947, Hayek convened the first ever meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, which was meant to unite these disparate groups into an exclusive forum dedicated to the defense of individualism and economic liberty across the globe. The inaugural conference took place at the Hotel du Parc in the Swiss mountain village of Mont Pelerin from April 1st to April 10th. Funding for the conference was secured from Dr. Albert Hunold of Switzerland and Harold Leno of the United States, two of the Mont Pelerin Society's earliest allies among business conservatives. 39 participants from 10 countries made it to the meeting, including a young Milton Friedman, who had traveled to Europe for the very first time to attend, and several that had been present back at the clock Walter Lippmann of 1938. Some of the members present at this inaugural meeting were Mises, Popper, Knight, Friedman, Stigler, Director, Reed, Harper, Hazlitt, Robbins, Ropke, Eukin, Dennison, Hunold, Jukes, Matchlup, Miller, and Polanyi. Though the Mont Pelerin Society framed its activism as a defense of classical liberalism, in practice, the society set out to hone a new conception of liberalism that answered the rallying cry of the road to serfdom and fought off the state interventionist ideas of Keynes, the U.S. New Deal politics, Britain's social democracy under Clement Attlee, and the centralized state planning theories following the Marxist tradition. The term neoliberalism, which had been coined at the clock Walter Lippmann, was preserved by the Mont Pelerin Society for having the distinct benefits of distancing itself from laissez-faire forms of capitalism and acknowledging that a strong state that protected competition would have to be won through a coherent political strategy. Of course, Hayek wasn't the only major influencer present at the inaugural conference. Along with The Road to Serfdom, two other books, Bureaucracy by Ludwig von Mises and The Open Society and Its Enemies by Karl Popper, had formed the opening salvo of neoliberal thought between 1944 and 1945. Mises made the arguments that governments were dominated by a stifling bureaucratic mindset and could never be as efficient or as innovative as private interests incentivized by the profit motive. Popper, on the other hand, criticized authors from Plato to Marx for their historicism, or their insistence that history had an inevitable destiny of revolution and utopia. But just as in the colloq Walter Lippmann, there were divergences in thought even between these early neoliberal writers, with Hayek and Mises again forming the core of the most market-centric variation of neoliberalism possible. While Hayek and Mises were in firm agreement about the superiority of free markets and the dangers of socialism, Popper was more skeptical of free markets and open to creating a unified front with socialists under what he called a larger humanitarian camp. These leftish views were not tolerated in the Mont Pelerin Society for long. 
Mises is famously remembered for standing up during a discussion on progressive income taxes and exclaiming, you're all a bunch of socialists. Popper was among the very first neoliberals in history, but after the open society, his influence soon waned compared to Hayek and Mises. At the first meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, the group was tasked with approving a statement of aims that would affirm their common convictions on which the work of the organization would be based. Though it went through multiple drafts plagued by controversy and bickering within the group, it was Lionel Robbins who, in the end, produced the final draft of the Mont Pelerin Society's statement of aims, which reads like so. The central values of civilization are in danger. Over large stretches of the Earth's surface, the essential conditions of human dignity and freedom have already disappeared. In others, they are under constant menace from the development of current tendencies of policy. The position of the individual and the voluntary group are progressively undermined by extensions of arbitrary power. Even that most precious possession of Western man, freedom of thought and expression, is threatened by the spread of creeds which, claiming the privilege of tolerance when in the position of a minority, seek only to establish a position of power in which they can suppress and obliterate all views but their own. The group holds that these developments have been fostered by the growth of a view of history which denies all absolute moral standards and by the growth of theories which question the desirability of the rule of law. It holds further that they have been fostered by a decline of belief in private property and the competitive market, for without the diffused power and initiative associated with these institutions, it is difficult to imagine a society in which freedom may be effectively preserved. The group does not aspire to conduct propaganda. It seeks to establish no meticulous and hampering orthodoxy. It aligns itself with no particular party. Its object is solely by facilitating the exchange of views among minds inspired by certain ideals and broad conceptions held in common to contribute to the preservation and improvement of the free society. The first conference proved a success, and the Mont Pelerin Society was formally registered as a nonprofit corporation in November 1947. With the formation of the Mont Pelerin Society, Hayek became the intellectual center of a global network of individuals dedicated to creating neoliberal reforms everywhere. The society agreed to meet again in two years, and the Mont Pelerin Society still meets to this day. Two years later, in 1949, Hayek further galvanized his new movement with another deeply prescient article, titled The Intellectuals on Socialism, in which he argued that the prevalence of both Keynesian and Marxist thought was thanks to the dedication of collectivist intellectuals, such as the New Dealers in America and the Fabian Society in Britain, to create an impenetrable consensus among the intellectual and political classes around the need to plan the economy. Hayek admired the power that they had consolidated in service to their ideas, and proposed to his neoliberal colleagues that they could do the same, if only they took a decades-long approach of slowly accumulating an avalanche of neoliberal research and activity that would one day create the same impenetrable intellectual consensus that the interventionists enjoyed in the 1930s and 40s. Hayek wrote on the need to fight the battle of ideas against socialism by learning from the strengths of the socialists themselves, specifically their tendency to advocate for an ambitious or even utopian vision of society that the public found persuasive and inspiring, regardless of how politically possible or impossible it seemed at the moment. So long as the people who over longer periods determine public opinion continue to be attracted by the ideals of socialism, the trend will continue. If we are to avoid such a development, we must be able to offer a new liberal program which appeals to the imagination. We must make the building of a free society once more an intellectual adventure, a deed of courage. What we lack is a liberal utopia, a program which seems neither a mere defense of things as they are, nor a diluted kind of socialism, but a truly liberal radicalism which does not spare the susceptibilities of the mighty, including the trade unions, which is not too severely practical, and which does not confine itself to what appears today as politically possible. We need intellectual leaders who are willing to work for an ideal, however small may be the prospects of its early realization. They must be men who are willing to stick to principles and to fight for their full realization, however remote. Crucially, Hayek placed supreme importance on the opinions of respected intellectuals, academics, and professionals in the fight to change the political consensus using their prestige. Hayek wrote, it is no exaggeration to say that, once the more active part of the intellectuals has been converted to a set of beliefs, the process by which these become generally accepted is almost automatic and irresistible. These intellectuals are the organs which modern society has developed for spreading knowledge and ideas, and it is their convictions and opinions which operate as the sieve through which all new conceptions must pass before they can reach the masses. Hayek's message to his colleagues was that the socialists had succeeded in creating a politics that was attractive to public intellectuals and that these public intellectuals were the disseminators of political ideas in the world. 
Only through a bold politics that didn't shy away from moving the status quo through persistent effort would their movement succeed over socialism. Hayek wrote, The main lesson which the true liberal must learn from the success of the socialists is that it was their courage to be utopian which gained them the support of the intellectuals and therefore an influence on public opinion, which is daily making possible what only recently seemed utterly remote. Those who have concerned themselves exclusively with what seemed practicable in the existing state of opinion have constantly found that even this had rapidly become politically impossible as the result of changes in a public opinion which they have done nothing to guide. But if we can regain that belief in the power of ideas, which was the mark of liberalism at its best, the battle is not lost. The intellectual revival of liberalism is already underway in many parts of the world. Will it be in time? For Hayek, seizing the mantle of prestige in academia and all other arenas of professional expertise was the key to injecting neoliberalism into the mainstream. From its inception, neoliberal economics was portrayed as a scientific and empirical field, rather than the product of political ideology. The effort to capture the rigor of fields such as physics or biology, to make neoliberal capitalism into unquestionable common sense, was largely successful thanks to the hard work of the Mont Pelerin Society and its network of academics and entrepreneurs who built the neoliberal consensus on both sides of the Atlantic. At the close of the 1940s, global civilization was sitting on one of the most profound inflection points in all of human history. World War II had concluded, and the unspeakable atrocities of death camps and nuclear annihilation had been revealed to all. The Bretton Woods negotiations had concluded, providing a new global economic system based primarily on the ideas of Keynes. Franklin Delano Roosevelt died partway through an unprecedented fourth term as President of the United States, and was succeeded by Harry S. Truman in 1945. Clement Attlee was victorious over the uber-popular wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill that same year, leading to a flurry of welfare and nationalization policies in Britain. Much, but not all of the world, was about to experience unprecedented prosperity under embedded liberalism, and the ideals of social democracy had never been more ascendant. However, the truth was that the post-war consensus was far from safe. Keynes himself had died in 1946, and therefore could not guide his followers in their implementation of his ideas or defend against critiques that would later emerge. The onset of America's Cold War with the Soviet Union would create a political climate hostile to all left politics, especially the idea of economic planning, at a time when social democratic movements around the world had just won crucial concessions from capital. Proxy wars between these greater world powers would prove that the argument over economic planning was far from over. It was within this tension, between the magnificent gains of social democracy and the hostile road laid before it, that Hayek and the Mont Pelerin Society were poised to begin dissolving the ground beneath all opponents of neoliberalism. In 1950, Hayek left Britain and moved to America, taking up a professorship at the University of Chicago. It was here, in Chicago, that neoliberalism would enter the next stage of its evolution in its fight against government intervention across the globe, with dire implications for the modern world. <laughs>